Well, the Orioles haven't been quite as busy as, say, the New York Mets over the last day or so, but still some Orioles news and notes to get to as they announce the Michael Givens signing. They announce who has been DFA'd off the roster, some interest being shown in two free agent starting pitchers, and some minor league signings to talk about. All coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles. Your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Thursday, December 22nd, 2022, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, We're going to get to some Orioles news and notes. A little roundup here for the final episode of the week. Again, here in the offseason, we are now down to three episodes per week. Generally, going to be coming out Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, but we had some O's news break this week. And with the holiday, a little Monday, Tuesday, Thursday podcasts here for you before a little holiday break here on Locked on Orioles. But we're going to talk about Michael Gibbons' deal being official who got taken off the roster, Lewin Diaz, via a DFA. Talk about the Orioles' interest in Rich Hill and Michael Waka and potentially adding more to the starting rotation. Could it be a trade if it's not them? And then we'll talk about the three right-handed pitchers the Orioles brought in on minor league deals and look into their careers a little bit further. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast. Before we get there, though, just did want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. Again, even though we're only three days a week, still bringing you all of the Orioles coverage this offseason. And although the plan is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, if news breaks on a different day, we will have very next morning a new episode of Locked on Orioles for you here throughout the off season. So we thank you for sticking with us. Make sure to subscribe and follow the pod wherever you listen, like comment and subscribe to the locked on Orioles YouTube channel as well. If you haven't already to get all of the Orioles content this off season, let's jump right into it because we do have some Orioles news to get to here to start the podcast. And first it's that the Michael Givens deal was made official by the Orioles on Wednesday. The O's agreeing to a one-year $5 million deal with the 32-year-old right-handed reliever Michael Givens, of course, bringing him back after the Orioles originally had drafted him, brought him up through the system, changed him from a shortstop to a right-handed pitcher. He was a big part of the Orioles' bullpen from 2015 through 2020. Then, of course, the Orioles dealt him to the Rockies for three players at the 2020 deadline. He's pitched for four teams since then, and now as a free agent, re-signs with the Orioles on a one-year deal. We've mentioned there is a mutual option for a second year for 2024, but again, a mutual option has not been picked up in Major League Baseball since the 2013 offseason, so it's most likely just a one-year deal for Michael Givens. Now, Givens did speak to the media on Wednesday as the deal was made official, talking about you know he was happy to be back in Baltimore. This is where... He kind of grew up as a person, as a player, loved his his time here, you know, talked about the bullpen back then when the O's were winning, being a family and hoping to kind of be a veteran and a leader for these younger pitchers and making the bullpen a family again in Baltimore in 2023 and all was was well and good in the press conference. Now, before the Givens move, the Orioles had a full 40 man roster. So when they signed Michael Givens, as I talked about on Tuesday's episode, breaking down the signing, if you haven't seen or heard that one, go back and listen to that pod on Tuesday. But I talked about how the Orioles were going to have to make a 40-man roster move, going to have to take someone off to put Givens on. And I speculated that Lewin Diaz would probably be the number one option for the Orioles. And it turns out he certainly was. The Orioles have designated Lewin Diaz for assignment to make room for Givens on the 40-man roster. Now, if Diaz is claimed by another team, he will go without ever playing a game for the Orioles and just being on their 40-man for a few weeks. Diaz was claimed off waivers from the Pirates a few weeks ago. That was after he had been DFA'd by the Marlins earlier in the offseason. Was a big-time prospect for the Marlins, but just never seemingly worked out. A 26-year-old left-handed hitting first baseman in Diaz who had 174 plate appearances in the big leagues with the Marlins in 2022. Hit just 169, had a 31% strikeout rate, and just a 45 WRC+. plus. He was 55% worse than the league average hitter. Now, he continues to be good in AAA. I mean, he hit 252, a 111 WRC+, plus, and almost 400 plate appearances in AAA last year. 
He's elite defensively at first base. The eye test and the metrics show he's one of the best defensive first basemen in all of baseball, but the bat has been so bad. And although he has some raw power, he has never tunneled into it in the major league level. And that's why he's being DFA'd by you know a team in the Marlins that needs offense badly. Now, the Orioles brought him in because the thought was, well, maybe with that defense there, he still has a little bit of a higher floor. And maybe the O's thought they could fix his swing. He could be kind of a backup option at first base to Ryan Mountcastle. He still could be. I mean, he still could potentially pass through waivers and the Orioles could potentially be able to keep him in the system. And I do think when the Orioles claimed him a few weeks back, the total plan was probably them knowing they were going to DFA him again because the 40 man roster was pretty full when they claimed him. They knew they were going to make at least some free agent additions as they have so far. I mean, they haven't made the big moves, but Kyle Gibson, Adam Frazier, Michael Givens so far, and they knew they were going to add at least three players and knew they'd have to DFA somebody. And it was probably going to be the most recent claim in Diaz. But if they do get to keep him in the org, he passes through waivers and he stays. I do think they will try to still work with him and have him be an option because right now on the current projected opening day roster, there's not really a fit, you know, as a backup first baseman behind Ryan Mountcastle, if, you know, he gets injured or just needs a day off or whatever it may be. I mean, you had Adley Rutschman who played a little first base in college and the Orioles worked him at first base in the minors. And then throughout the year last year, after the Orioles traded Trey Mancini, They worked out Anthony Santander and Taryn Vavra at first base some. Of course, the O's do have Tyler Nevin on the 40-man roster as well, but he kind of fell completely out of favor last year with poor performance in the big leagues. So they kind of don't have that backup first baseman. They claim Diaz. They signed Franchi Cordero to a minor league deal. Those are kind of the two top options right now. Of course, Santander, Vavra, Adley, and Nevin are all still around to be those emergency options, but... If they do still keep Diaz, he's just not on the 40-man, he'll come to big league spring training with a chance to make the team if he can figure out the bat because the O's, they're going to have to have somebody on the roster besides Mountcastle who can play first base. So it's either going to be that, you know, Cordero or Diaz or someone like that makes the team or the Orioles maybe sign another kind of first base DH corner outfield guy in free agency. There still are a few guys left like that. Or they kind of just roll with it being, you know, Adley, Santander, and Vavra and comfortable enough that in a pinch, you know, they could step in if there were an injury, but it was probably the plan most of the time that they were going to DFA him. And and I still think they do hope they can keep him because they probably see at least something that they can work on. Now with the Givens deal, him being added, Diaz taken off the 40 man roster is still full at this point with 40 players and the O's aren't going to be done adding players. I don't think they're going to add big names, but whether it be trading for big leaguers, whether it be just, I mean, signing a a backup catcher to a big league deal, whether it be, you know, I'm sure they're going to make at least one more waiver claim this off season. Yankees DFA had a couple of interesting pitchers on Wednesday. There's going to be another move that needs to be made. And I do think kind of next up on the chopping block of the 40 man roster is probably Tyler Nevin. I think he was at least a step up from Diaz because he's been in the O's org. That's why he didn't get DFA this time, but Nevin could be next. I mean, had such a rough 2022, kind of fell out of favor, end of the year in AAA. So many infielders have passed him on the depth chart. I think he could be next. And then probably after him, I would say Bruce Zimmerman because of the struggles. And then you get to guys like Spencer Watkins, Nick Vespi, and and Joey Crable, and others like that who could be on the 40-man roster bubble. But just something to look for when the Orioles do make that next move. But Speaking of a next move, we know that most of the best free agents are off the board at this point, but the Orioles still could make a move. Now, I hope it would be a guy like Nathan Eovaldi, who is far and away the best free agent pitcher still remaining, as I record here on Wednesday evening. But the Orioles have shown interest in actually two other 2022 Boston Red Sox starting pitchers, Rich Hill and Michael Waka. So coming up next, we'll talk about the seasons that each of those guys had in Boston last year and how they could help the Orioles' rotation in 2023. But first, this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast is brought to you by BetOnline.net, which is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis this December. Because as we get to the holidays, you know, it always feels like NFL, but it really, to me, feels like bowl season. You got bowl games During the week, during the day, just always going on college football bowl games and all the lines, all the odds for every bowl game. You can find them at betonline.net. Even the Duke's Mayo Bowl with my Terps against NC State. 
next Friday as well. But of course, there's every NFL game. Ravens play it on Saturday again on Christmas Eve, a full day of games on that day on Christmas Day as well. Then you got college basketball, you got the NBA, you got the NHL. You can bet on it all at betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, which I hope you do if you're listening to this one, you can find those at Bet Online as well. They are always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more at Bet Online, where the game starts. So with the Orioles having announced the Michael Givens move and DFAing Lewin Diaz, they still do have a full 40-man roster, but I don't think they're done this offseason. And over the last week or so, they have been connected to two more free agent starting pitchers. Now, their only starting pitching addition so far has been Kyle Gibson. Early in the offseason, bringing in the veteran righty on a one-year $10 million deal, kind of looked like, yeah, he'll be their four or five starter, the veteran innings eater, and kind of upgrade over Jordan Lyles and congratulations to Jordan Lyles ended up getting a two year, $17 million deal with the Kansas city Royals. So he got himself a multi-year deal that the Orioles just were not willing to give out to him this off season. I still do think the Orioles upgraded slightly with Gibson over Lyles, but it seems like the O's are still at least poking around the market or what's left of it for free agent starting pitching. Now, Far and away, the best guy left, as I mentioned, is Nathan Eovaldi. And the Orioles have checked in on Eovaldi. There is some interest there, but I think they're going to be outbid because they've shown this offseason they're not really willing to give more than two-year deals and not willing to spend big money. So if they're going to sign other pitchers in free agency, you got to go down to the next tier. And let's start with Michael Waka because I think there's an argument to be made that after Eovaldi, the second best free agent starting pitcher still left is Michael Waka. Now, MLB.com's John Morosi last week reporting that the Orioles, quote, are showing continued interest in Michael Waka. Now, he's not going to be as expensive as some of these other pitchers. His median contract projection this offseason was a two-year, $16 million deal. I would think he's probably going to get something more like two years for 20 to $25 million, just with how big the starting pitching market has been. I mean, if you think about it, Kyle Gibson got $10 million. There's an argument to be made that Waka is better than Gibson. So Waka's probably not taking $8 million per year. He's probably going to look for more like two years, $25 million. The Orioles have offered deals like that to other pitchers. They didn't get this offseason, so they could certainly pay, I think, even with the certain constraints from the Angelos family. They could certainly pay the two years, $25 million for a starting pitcher like Michael Waka. Now, where is Waka right now? He's not that young stud potential ace he was, you know, when he was a, a rookie with the Cardinals, but he is still effective. 31 years old now, Michael Waka, the right-handed pitcher who spent the 2022 season with the Boston Red Sox. Now, he has been bouncing around a little bit over the past few years of his career, had that long stretch with St. Louis, then became a free agent, was with the Mets in 2020, the Rays in 2021, and the Red Sox in 2022. And last year with Boston, he was in the rotation the whole year that he was healthy, only made 23 starts and threw 127 and a third innings. And in that span had a 3.32 ERA, got a little lucky, a 4.14 FIP, but still the stuff was solid. Now, just 7.3 Ks per nine for Michael Waka was a career low, the lowest strikeout rate of his career. Now his walk rate, 2.2 walks per nine, that was his second lowest walk rate. So his walks were down, but strikeouts were down last season for Waka and his fastball velocity at just averaging 93 miles per hour. Also the lowest fastball velo of his career. So stuff not quite the same for Waka, but if you look at just his output in total, a 1.5 war, according to fan graphs was his best number since 2017. So at least was getting a little more effective in 2022 with Boston. Now, how did he do it? Well, it's the changeup. It's the pitch that's been, his best throughout his career, and it continues to be his best. It's his number two offering. This changeup has a 35% whiff rate. Opponents hit just 170 against his changeup last year. He plays it off his 93-mile-per-hour fastball, and he's got a cutter, a sinker, and a curveball that Waka works in there as well. But I think the really interesting thing about Michael Waka is that he is a reverse splits right-hander. And we saw this last year because the Orioles, you know, with Waka being in Boston, they faced Waka multiple times last season, and they would always load their lineup with righties. And many would ask, well, he's a righty pitcher. Why are you putting so many right-handed hitters in the lineup? Well, he is an extreme reverse splits guy. Last season, right-handed pitch, right-handed hitters, I should say, 
hit 265 with a 455 slugging percentage against Waka. Not terrible, not amazing. Left-handed batters hit only 188 with a 345 slugging percentage against Waka. That's because that changeup dips down and away from lefties. It's almost impossible for lefties to hit that change. It's by far his best pitch, and that's why he's so good against left-handers. So while the Orioles would like to get a left-handed starter to kind of help out against lefties, and you know, you'd like to hold left-handed hitters down because it's still a short porch in right field that our lefties are going to pull it to, whereas the new wall itself continues to hold right-handed hitters down, you would kind of like guys who get lefties out. So you're either looking for a left-handed pitcher or you're looking for a guy like Michael Waka, who, although he's a righty, gets lefties out at a high rate. So that's one big reason I do think that he fits in Baltimore. Now, one issue was he did have multiple injury issues last season. That's why he only made 23 starts and only pitched 127 innings. And the other thing is he only pitched 127 innings that was his highest total since 2017 when he threw 166 innings as a 25-year-old in St. Louis. And the only other time he's thrown more than that was 181 innings with the Cardinals in 2015 at age 23. He has been somewhat injured for a good chunk of his career. Again, only one season, 2015, where he made 30 starts and stayed healthy the whole year. Every other year since he's been kind of a full-time player, there's been some sort of injury issue with Michael Waka. Even in 2020, in the shortened season with the Mets, he only made seven starts. He only threw 34 innings. Now, the injury last year, there was two of them. The first one came in May. It was a quick injury. He went on the 15-day injured list, and he came off right after the 15 days. It was intercostal irritation, which is basically when you have some irritation in your nerves that are right below your ribs. But he came back immediately and pitched for the next month fine. Then he went on the injured list in early July with right shoulder inflammation, hadn't pitched since June 28th, and he did not pitch again until August 14th. He missed about a month and a half, right around six weeks with that right shoulder inflammation. Now, he did come back in mid-August, and he did stay healthy for you know the last about six or seven weeks of the season with the Red Sox, which is certainly a plus. I mean, that's a, a solid stretch for him to stay healthy down the stretch, but it is a little concerning. And he was much better in the first half before that bigger injury. He had a 2.69 ERA in the first half and a 4.11 ERA in the second half. And when he returned from the injury, he had a 5.57 ERA in September and October. So wasn't quite the same pitcher. So that's a little concerning. Again, he's only 31. It's not like he's getting way up there in age. It kind of feels like Waka is a lot older but that's because he, you know, burst onto the scene at a very young age, 21 years old in 2013. He came up with St. Louis, had a sub three ERA in the regular season and, and actually helped the Cardinals get to the World Series that year in the postseason as a rookie. So that's why it seems like he's a lot older. But again, it's some injury concerns and he hasn't been great lately. I mean, a 505 ERA with the Rays in 2021. Shortened season with the Mets, 34 innings, kind of throw that out. But a 4-7 ERA with St. Louis in 2019. He hasn't really had a, a, a good year since 2018. And, and even that year, he only made 15 starts because of injury. So it's a risk. But if it's only around two years, 20 million, eh, it's not the worst deal in the world. You would like to upgrade a little bit. And then the other guy they're looking at is another guy who pitched with the Red Sox last year. And that is one of the wonders of the world right now. Rich Hill, the 42-year-old lefty Rich Hill, who will actually be 43 before opening day next year. And if the O's did sign him, he would be the oldest player ever to appear in a game for the Orioles. Now, Rich Hill somehow, at age 42 this season, Still getting guys out. And Rob Bradford of WEEI, the station that covers the Red Sox, did tweet out that not only are the Orioles showing interest in Waka, but they are also showing interest in Rich Hill. That was also reported last week. Now, Hill, as we know, has pitched for the Orioles before, pitched for the O's all the way back in 2009. That was kind of right around the time when Hill was trying to remake himself as a pitcher, and he kind of finally did remake himself um, when he got to Boston a couple years later. But 
He did go to Baltimore that year. He did make 13 starts. He did have a 7.80 ERA in an Orioles uniform. And that is when he kind of decided to make a change in his career. But since he's gone more breaking balls with the high spin, he's still been good even at an advanced age. I mean, this year with the Red Sox, Rich Hill in 2022, he made 26 starts this season, 124 and a third inning. So again, not the most durable pitcher in the world, but a 4.27 ERA and a 3.92 FIP for Hill, it's not the worst thing in the world. Now, 7.89 7.89 strikeouts per nine. That is the lowest in any full season for Rich Hill since he last pitched for the Orioles in 2009. So the strikeouts weren't quite there. Now the walks were down. He had his lowest walks per nine since, I mean, if you're looking at, at full seasons, this is lowest walks per nine since really ever in his career. So he was throwing more strikes, but wasn't paying as many guys. I mean, It's still the stuff you know from Rich Hill, an 89-mile-per-hour fastball. He's not going to blow you away with it, but he's going to throw those big, big breaking balls that he continues to throw, the big curveball, and especially the slider, which 32% whiff rate, opponents hit only 220 against it. You know, the big, slow, 69-mile-per-hour curveball, and he'll throw in the cutter, and he'll throw in the changeup, and he'll throw in the sinker just to, you know, throw the kitchen sink at you and keep you off guard. Now, He did miss a little time last year. That's why he only made 26 starts, but he was 42 years old. You're not counting on a 42-year-old to pitch an entire season for you. Hill's still been okay, even at this age. I mean, in 2021, he had a 3.86 ERA. I mean, he can still do it. He can still strike guys out. Pitch with the Rays and the Mets that year. I mean, in the short in 2020, he had a 303 ERA, 2019 with the Dodgers, a 2.45 ERA. I mean, he was still 39 that year with LA. So he's still getting guys out. And, you know, he had one good start against the Orioles last year, one really bad start against the O's. He's basically at the point where he doesn't face lefties. I believe he faced less than 100 left-handed hitters this season because when he starts, teams just load their lineup with eight or sometimes nine right-handed hitters against him because he's just so much better against lefties, but it would help in the ballpark. But I just think at this point for the Orioles, whether it's Hill or Waka, and they're different pitchers, you know, Hill's one year, maybe he retires. Waka, you could sign for two years and maybe bring him back beyond that if he continues to pitch well, because he's only 31 at this point. But Waka, I would rather have than Rich Hill. But overall with these two guys, it still feels like the Orioles just need a, a better option. And I think you can make an argument that Michael Waka is better than a couple of the Orioles' current options. I don't know if you can make that argument with 43-year-old Rich Hill. So I just don't know if the Orioles will make either of these signings. Again, they haven't. It's just been, you know, reported interest in these two free agent starting pitchers, and they'd be fairly cheap. And I think both of them, if they were in the rotation, would certainly help the Orioles win some baseball games in 2023. And again, I would like Waka more, and I think I could get on board with Michael Waka, but it's just... It's not super exciting, and I don't think it's a big-time upgrade for the Orioles at this point. It would help them, either guy. It's just kind of like Kyle Gibson. It would help them, but it's not the gigantic upgrade that I think you're looking for to take that next step next season. So it, it kind of does turn things to, would the Orioles make a trade for a starting pitcher? And you know we'll continue next week our series kind of looking at, at trade candidates for the O's among starting pitchers. We talked about Marco Gonzalez and Chris Flexen from the Mariners back on Monday's episode, if you want to go check that one out. But there's options out there. I've heard some rumors that, you know, the Orioles are talking about potentially, you know, Ramon Arias. And obviously, you know, if you didn't see the the headlines or read the article from Ken Rosenthal in his column earlier this week, he said the Orioles are receiving calls about Jorge Mateo in trade talks. And, you know, that's a, a whole nother conversation we won't get into as deep on this episode, but you know, the Orioles are receiving calls for Jorge Mateo because all the big shortstops are off the board now, especially with the Mets coming in and swooping Carlos Correa. Teams still need shortstops and there's just not the free agents out there. So they may look for trades and, you know, I don't want to trade Jorge Mateo, but if it could get the Orioles a, a pretty good starting pitcher in a package, Mateo's limited because of the bat and the and the strikeout rate, even though his defense elite is base stealing elite. You could get better if you flipped Mateo for a starting pitcher. Again, I wouldn't do it unless it's a big time name, but maybe that's, you know, the instance. I know the Orioles have, have been talking with the Mets a little bit potentially because of all the signings they've made. They're probably going to trade some of their more depth pieces. Maybe the O's can go there, but 
it'll definitely be interesting to see it. And we'll certainly address these Jorge Mateo rumors a little bit more on most likely Monday's episode or at least next week on the pod. But, you know, it's definitely interesting to see kind of what the O's would try and do to, to get starting pitching this offseason. One thing they have done, at least in the last couple of days, is, is try to upgrade the bullpen somewhat with veteran guys and somewhat on the margins as well. Of course, they brought in Michael Givens, but also earlier this week, the Orioles signed three right-handed pitchers, three relievers, two minor league deals, guys that certainly don't have any kind of inside edge to make the opening day bullpen, but could be some depth that maybe one of them hits and one of them helps the Orioles next year. We'll talk about who those three pitchers are coming up next. But first, let's talk about this. Did you know that driving high is considered driving under the influence? That's right. Driving under the influence of marijuana is against the law in every state, even in states where marijuana is legal. That means driving high could get you a DUI. And if you think law enforcement officers can't tell when you're driving high, you're wrong. Your friends can tell, your coworkers can tell, even your parents can tell. Everyone can tell. So what makes you think that law enforcement officers don't know when you're driving high? Driving under the influence of marijuana can slow your response time and change how you perceive time and speed. So even if you think you're fine to drive when you're high, you're not. Because the bottom line is, if you feel different, you drive different. And driving high is driving under the influence. So remember, drive high, get a DUI. Paid for by NHTSA. So to finish up today's Orioles news and notes episode, talking about three minor league deals that the Orioles gave out earlier this offseason. And again, I know the minor league deals aren't the most exciting things, but they're super cheap. They're low risk. They're sometimes high reward. You sometimes pick up guys who really help you. You know, even on the margins, you can get guys who help you just eat some innings. I mean, the Orioles, you know, brought in guys like, like Denny Reyes last year, who just ended up eating a few innings that the Orioles needed last season. It's it's kind of guys like that. Sometimes you'll really hit on a minor league free agent, but it's mostly just depth on the margins that just doesn't cost much. We know the O's have already brought in Nomar Mazzara and Franchi Cordero. I think both of those guys will at least compete for a roster spot with the Orioles. These three guys may be a little less, but definitely will be probably in the Norfolk Tides bullpen and certainly could be depth if the Orioles need it in terms of relief help. So they brought in three right-handed pitchers on minor league deals. Let's start with Edward Bizzardo. Probably, if you knew the name of one of these three guys, it would probably be Bizzardo. That's because he faced the Orioles last season. 27-year-old righty was with the Boston Red Sox last year, actually threw 16 and a third innings in the big leagues, had a 2.76 ERA, 11 strikeouts to just four walks in that time. He's been in the minor league since 2015, but did finally get to the big leagues this year. Now in AAA last year with Boston, 57 innings, a 3.45 ERA, about nine and a half strikeouts and three walks per nine innings. The stuff is good. He's a slider heavy pitcher. He gets big swing and miss on that slider, which he just throws and throws and throws, throws only almost 50% of the time. Then he's got a, about a 94 mile per hour fastball, has a sinker and a change up to go with it. But it's really about that fastball slider combo for Bizarro, who again did face the O's and, and did pitch in the bigs with success last year with the Red Sox. I think he's the most likely of these three to make any kind of impact or even pitch in the big leagues with the Orioles next season. But the other of the three guys who does have some big league experience is Kyle Dowdy. He is a 29-year-old right-handed pitcher who spent last season with the Cincinnati Reds, did make two appearances in the big leagues with the Reds, six and a third scoreless innings, three strikeouts, three walks, five hits in that span, uh, but obviously spent much more time in AAA last year through 52 and a third innings, a 3.96 ERA with about nine and a half Ks per nine and a little over five walks per nine. So the walks have certainly been an issue for Dowdy but he does have strikeout stuff. Now, he did have a larger MLB sample size all the way back in 2019 when he made his debut with the Texas Rangers. Back then, he threw about 22 innings, had a 7.25 ERA, kind of the reason why he did not get back to the bigs until this year. But he's another big breaking ball heavy guy. His curveball is his most used pitch, kind of gets the strikeout with that. Then he has a fastball that, you know, 96, 97, got some good run to it and throws a cutter in there to try and get left-handed batters out as well. Was a 2015 12th round selection by 
I believe the Texas Rangers back then and uh, now signs with the Orioles as a minor league free agent. And then the last one, probably the best name out of the three is Wandison Charles, a 26 year old right-handed pitcher who spent uh, 2022 in the Oakland athletic system. That's where he's been his whole career since he was signed out of the Dominican Republic and started his pro career in 2015 this year, becoming a free agent for the first time. Now he was only in double a last year and he is the one guy of these three who has not reached the big leagues yet. And in double a last year, he threw 37 innings with 34 strikeouts. That's pretty good. Here's the bad. 57 hits in 37 innings, 38 walks, more walks than strikeouts, and an 11.43 ERA at the AA level. So you're asking, why in the world did the Orioles give this guy a minor league contract? Well, he's got an interesting build. He's 6'5", 250, kind of built like a linebacker. And the fastball is big. 95 to 98, touches 99 and 100. Fangraph's Eric Longenhagen put his fastball at a 70 out of 80 future value. That's an elite pitch. Now, his only other pitch is a slider, and he doesn't really command it well, but the fastball has really good velo. It is a really, really good pitch. He's been pitching in the Dominican Winter League this year and has been much better. He did miss all of 2021 with injury, so was kind of coming back from injury, pitching in double A for the first time. That's probably why the stats were bad. But hey, maybe he gets a shot out of the Norfolk bullpen. But that's the three guys the Orioles brought in on minor league deals. Again, not much of a chance for them probably to pitch in the bigs just because the Orioles bullpen is so deep already. But hey, you always need depth. They'll most likely all three be in the Tides bullpen to start the season. And you never know. A couple guys get hurt. A couple of these guys break out in Norfolk. Could see them in Baltimore at some point in 2023. But guys, I hope to see in Baltimore in 2023. Well, that would be Jorge Mateo. But it certainly does sound like teams are calling on him. Now, that does not mean the Orioles are shopping Jorge Mateo. In fact, it does not mean that. What it means is teams need shortstops. They think the O's might trade him. And they're talking to Mike Elias about it. So next week on the pod, when we're back on Monday, we'll talk about those Jorge Mateo trade rumors, what they mean for the Orioles, their plan moving forward. And if the O's did deal Mateo, what would have to come back to make us happy and to make Mike Elias happy in that kind of deal? But again, that's coming up on Monday when we return here on the podcast. Until then, enjoy your holiday weekend. Hopefully you're enjoying some time off. And this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.